All right, this is the College of Complexes in Chicago, Illinois, at the Lincoln Restaurant. It's 8 o'clock on a Saturday. Uh, the rules in the, at the college are one full at a time. That means one speaker at a time. Oh, boom! Quiet. And, and it also, uh, the other rule is to not insult people's Mother. nationalities. Uh, no, nationalities or personalities are no insults to uh, persons close to them or not close to them. Uh, no insults, generally speaking. No, it's no fun. No fun at all. Uh, and now I introduce uh, Brahm to introduce the speaker. Oh, announcement period. And the announcement period. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Dan. Uh, that was Dan Weinberg, our professional clownman, but he's not teaching. Uh, and you do bar mitzvahs and bas mitzvahs. Yeah. All right. Birthday parties. Birthday parties. And Anything else? All right. Um, let's see. So, tonight, we're out of control. Uh, a 15-year battle against control unit prisons. And we have as our speaker, Nancy Kershon, who is the author of a new book and a founding member of the Committee to End the Marion Barton. Thank you. I'm glad I have a mic tonight because <clears throat> I'm just getting over a cold, so I'll do the best I can. So um, I am the author of this book that we've been showing around here, and <clears throat> right, and it's the story of um, a 15-year battle against control unit prisons from 1985 to 2000 that was waged here in Chicago. Was, was centered here in Chicago by a sm relatively small group of people, although many, many people worked with us, uh, to shut down control unit prisons, which you may not be familiar with the term, but basically they're prisons where the prisoners are in long-term, indefinite period of time, solitary confinement under conditions of sensory deprivation. And uh, I'm not a writer. I like to consider myself an activist, but I did write this book and I wrote it for three reasons. Well, several reasons, but some of which are, I passionately believe that the conditions inside U.S. prisons today are a human rights nightmare. And uh, I also believe that the prisons are racist institutions uh, that have little to do with crime control and everything to do with the control of people of color in this country, the social control of people of color. Uh, and I consider my work around prisons to be a continuation of the support that I felt for the civil rights movement in the 1960s. Uh, and uh, the third reason that I wrote this book is because actually well, well, let me ask, how many people in this room have ever heard of Pelican Bay? Okay, so some of you have. That's good. So that, that's a control unit prison in California. And how many of you know that this past summer there was a hunger strike that at one point involved 30,000 prisoners in the state of California? So like, and I'm guessing you're m more informed than most people in this country are, given that you have these regular discussions about important matters. Um, but uh, that hunger strike went on for two months, and I knew it was coming because there had been two previous attempts at a hunger strike. And I wrote the book partly to support that effort that was going on. Um, 
I, before, I'm going to read a little bit from the book, but I want to start with some preliminary remarks. <clears throat> I want to give you some background history. Some of you may know this. I apologize if it's repetitive. Um, but was it Andy who was saying, I forget the term that he used, conservative, what was that term? Conceptual conservatism. Conceptual conservatism. Well, um, I think that um, it's important to understand the past because the, in this case especially, the past will indicate that the present situation was not always the way it was. It once was different, and it was just by human decision-making that it, that it changed into the current situation. And I think we have to have, be, have an, imagine, be able to imagine what the future could hold that would be really different from what we have now. Otherwise, we get really stuck in believing that the status quo is just always how it is, how it was, how it is, and how it will be. So, uh, before 1963, <clears throat> there were no control unit prisons in the United States. Alcatraz was the worst prison in the U.S. As you probably know, it sat on an island in the, in the San Francisco Bay. And um, it was the worst prison in the United States, the end of the line prison. It struck fear into the hearts of prisoners and non-prisoners alike. But that, and, and at that prison were the people that the United States government disliked the most. Morton Sobel was there, who was a co-defendant of Ethel and Julius Rosenberg, who were electrocuted during the um, McCarthy anti-communist period. Uh, Rafael Cancel Miranda was there. He's, he was a Puerto Rican patriot and independentista, and he was imprisoned at Marion. And of course, many other non-political pr prisoners were there as well, but people that the government really disliked. And let me say, there's, there's two sets of prisons in the United States. One is run by the federal government through its Bureau of Prisons. And the other set, actually every state has its own. So you probably know here in Illinois, the Illinois Department of Corrections runs the prisons in Illinois. But Alcatraz was the end of the line for the, in the federal prison system run by the U.S. government. In, um, but Alcatraz ran relatively, although it was on an island and so it was isolated, it ran very freely by today's standards. That is, um, prisoners worked together, they ate in a communal dining hall. You can go on a tour there of the prison, maybe some of you have, it's a historical site now park. You can see the dining hall where they ate. They had recreational activities together, religious activities. They, um, they weren't in their cells even most of the day. They were working and participating in other programs. Um, and then in 1963, Alcatraz prison was closed and a new prison was opened by the federal government in downstate Illinois, about 350 miles from Chicago, in Marion, Illinois, which is near Carbondale, where the university is, SIU. Uh, that was opened in 63, and now that was the end of the line prison in 63. But that prison also ran openly, the way I described Alcatraz was similar to how that prison was run in 1963. And again, some, interestingly enough, disparate numbers of political prisoners were sent there. So Leonard Peltier, you may know him, the Native American political prisoner was in Marion. Some Black Panthers, some Yadakoli, several others were there. Um, and in, in 63 to 72, uh, Rafael Cancel Miranda was there, who had been at Alcatraz, the Puerto Rican independentista. And in the year of 1972, there was a brutal beating of a Mexican prisoner by the guards at Marion. And the response of the prisoners was to, um, to, to go on a uh, work stoppage. That is, they just didn't go, they were working, and they just said that day they weren't going to go to work. 
Well, the response of the prison was to seize on that opportunity to lock down what they said, who they said were the leaders. So they, they put Raphael and other people in one wing of the of one wing of the prison, and in that wing they created the first control unit in this country. So in, they locked people up for an indefinite amount of time, 23 hours a day, um, no natural air or light, no windows, no eating outside yourself. All the food was put through a slot in the door. Nothing like a communal setting like this. Um, no group recreation, no religious services. Very restricted visiting over plexiglass walls on phones with guards a, a couple feet away. Only immediate family and very rare visits and very rare phone calls. So basically they were really isolating people. That was in 72. And then 11 years later, and that was just one unit of the prison. 11 years later, two prisoners were killed actually by the Aryan, well, they were, the, the accused, the, those who were accused were members of the Aryan Brotherhood of killing these two, two guards inside the control unit. So the unit that was supposed to reduce violence in the prison is where the violence took place. Um, and that, so that was in 1982. Or is it 83? <laughs> anyway, um, and what happened then was interesting. Although the rest of the prison was totally quiet, only involving, this incident involved two people in the control unit, two Aryan Brotherhood prisoners. There was no work stoppage, no rebellion in the prison, nothing like that. And nonetheless, the prison administration seized on that opportunity to lock down the entire prison of 350 men. They actually ran them through a gauntlet of guards who beat them, and then put every single prisoner in an isolation cell. That was in 83, 83. And um, two years later, my friends and I in Chicago, we had done different kinds of prison work here and there, each of us. Um, Steve Whitman, who happens to be my husband, was one of them. Jan Sessler from the People's Law Office. We got together and we decided that we needed to do something because we understood that what we were seeing was a significant historical development and that actually the government was seizing on the opportunity to implement a plan that probably had been in the works to restructure prison life in the United States. And so we formed this group, and we were doing other things. We were doing anti-war work around Central America and other things, different ones of us doing different things. We just started doing this briefly, but then we found we couldn't walk away from it, and we spent the next 15 years dealing with this, this situation. Um, so... Um, we, I'm going to read a little bit from my book. Um, we were, we were concerned about marrying, not just as an individual prison, but we were worried that control units would actually spread like a disease throughout the country. The Bureau of Prisons insisted that if you took the bad apples and put them all in one place, then every, everybody else could exist more freely. And we disagreed back then. We said no. What's going to happen is it's going to, the control unit is going to serve as an anchor and drag the whole prison system in, in, a, in a reactionary uh, direction. Um, so, let's see. It seemed imperative to do something before the lockdown became set in stone. We were terrified that if Marion became an accepted model, that proliferation would inevitably follow. We saw Marion as an experiment. We believe they were trying the experiment out, not only on the prisoners who were being held in these cages and tortured, but also as an experiment being perpetrated on the American public through Congress, the courts, and arenas of public opinion. If these horrific conditions could win public acceptability, then the government would establish control units everywhere. 
Unfortunately, our predictions turned out to be absolutely right, and even an underestimation, because as I will document throughout this piece, control units have proliferated not only through the federal system, but also in virtually every state in the United States. It's remarkable to think that when we started doing this work in 1985, not one state in the U.S. had a control unit prison, and now virtually every state has at least one. Furthermore, in a progression we never could have envisioned, the model has now spread throughout the world, Abu Ghraib, Guantanamo, etc. And on any given day, this is just a, an update, there are about 80,000 prisoners in the United States who are living under these these kinds of conditions. So it is, I think it is one of those untold stories, or relatively untold stories. Um, I mentioned the social control of people of color, and I don't know, have any of you read Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow? Yeah, it's really an excellent book, and if you haven't read it, I recommend it. In, in that book, she talks about slavery, uh, the abolishment of slavery, then leading to Jim Crow, then morphing into legal segregation, and then in this current era, into mass incarceration. And she talks about all those um, institutions as um, racialized, function as racialized uh, systems to maintain class different, racial class differences. And we were writing, much, it's a great book, I love it. Uh, interestingly enough, we were writing much about the same, our thinking was going in the same direction only about 25 years ago. And um, this reading, um, Steve is a statistician and he did a lot of statistical magic, um, not magic, <laughs> the opposite of magic. He d it did a lot of crunching of numbers to figure out what was going on in the prisons. And this is uh, about a presentation that he gave in 1986. So Steve spoke for the committee then the Marion lockdown. And he began by reaffirming that Dostoevsky was right when he said that if you want to understand a society, you should look into its prisons. He pointed out that who is in prison gives great insight into what the purpose of prisons must be. Steve had spent a considerable amount of time using various books, journals, government documents, and phone calls to the UN to gather information about imprisonment rates, and he presented the data in the form of a slideshow. Does anybody remember a slideshow? <laughs> yeah, that in the old days. I don't believe anything like this had ever been done before. Although these types of statistics have become common, back then this was cutting edge documentation. Through statistics and graphs, he drew a dramatic picture and concluded the following. And this is Steve's words. I offer the following observations. First, prisons are being filled at a rate faster than ever before in the history of the United States, and this has nothing to do with crime. This increase is associated with more and more people of color going to prison at a rate that is the highest in the world. When these two observations are put together, I think that it tells us that prisons are some kind of a control mechanism for people of color and some attempt to contain them both physically and politically. Dovetailing with Steve's presentation, Jose Lopez dated major changes in the criminal justice system to 1965, the year of the assassination of Malcolm X and the establishment of the, Universal, uh, the Uniform Criminal Justice Code. These all occurred about the time Steve's data showed the beginning of dramatic increases in the number of people imprisoned in the United States. A breakthrough occurred on May 31st, 1987, when the Chicago Tribune actually printed a long opinion piece by Steve. And I say a breakthrough because it was rare that the mass media would respond to any of this, let alone take a good position around it. Um, but they did print a piece entitled The Crime of Black Imprisonment, highlighting the phrase, quote, the total number of black men in the United States who have been in prison is about three million, roughly the population of Chicago. And of course, it's much more now, but.
Steve wrote that whereas in the US a black person was six times more likely to go to prison than a white person, in Illinois the figure jumped to ten times more likely. What's more, the US black imprisonment rate was the highest in the world, beating out even apartheid South Africa. Steve went on to say, William Nagel, a well-known criminologist, analyzed many factors in each state to determine which were related to rapidly increasing imprisonment rates. He found no relationship between the crime rate and the imprisonment rate, and no relationship between the crime rate and the proportion of black people living in a state. However, Nagel discovered a very strong relationship between the imprisonment rate and the proportion of black people the imprisonment rate, not the crime rate. In other words, people go to prison in increasing numbers because they are black, not because of a rise in the crime rate. So, um, I think that our analysis was right, as demonstrated by the fact that the predictions that we made, unfortunately, came true. I think it's very hard to make predictions about the social political events, but we did, and and they did come true. Um, we predicted there would be an explosion in incarceration rates, and there were. We predicted control units would proliferate, and they did. So I'm going to talk a little bit, that's a little bit about our thinking, and probably some of you don't agree completely with what I said, and we can talk about it later. Um, but I also want to talk a little bit about what our work looked like. And uh, one aspect of our work was that we, we believed in giving voice to the prisoners, not just working on their behalf, but actually trying to bring their voices out because these are people whose voices don't get heard and are, are suppressed. Um, and so every year uh, we would have an educational event and we would solicit uh, pieces from the prisoners uh, on their reflections of the lockdown, what, what they, they were seeing. And uh, one year, Rafael Cancel, um, not Rafael, so Rafael Cancel Miranda, who I mentioned earlier, was pardoned by Jimmy Carter in 1979. But by the time we started our work in 85, um, there was a new Puerto Rican political prisoner, Marion, and his name is Oscar Lopez Rivera. And he is still in prison today. He's been in prison for 32 years, which is more than Nelson Mandela even, who just recently died. Um, and there was just a march in Puerto Rico of 50,000 people calling for his release that cut across all political lines in, in Puerto Rico because he is now a patriot and national hero of the Puerto Rican people. And there's a campaign on in Chicago about Oscar Lopez Rivera as well because this is where he spent most of his life and did most of his work. He started a high school here which is now a pretty substantial alternative high school in Humboldt Park. And I, I will have letters afterwards if anyone would like to sign a letter to President Obama around that issue or if you want more information. So um, the next thing is I would just like to read Oscar's statement about the control unit at Marion that he wrote in 1988 for our program. But I'm going to ask my husband, Steve, to write it so my voice doesn't give out to read it. I don't think I need the microphone. Can you all hear me okay? Why don't you have the mic? So these are... Uh, better with the uh, microphone. Better with the microphone. Okay, so these are words that Oscar wrote uh, and are in Nancy's book. And they say, and this is the direct quote from Oscar, it's very difficult for people who have never been exposed to the hostile and destructive environment of prisons to appreciate the experiences that prisoners are forced to endure while subjected to a lockdown like the one in Marion. When I arrived here in 1986, there were prisoners with whom I had shared books and discussed political ideas. 
Within two years, I've been able to observe a tremendous transformation in their personalities. Some are no longer interested in reading or engaging in political discussion. They prefer to watch television. They seem withdrawn, tense, and to have short fused tempers. Looking at those changes make me realize that I must have changed also. That preoccupies me because I am conscious that the objective of the lockdown is to rob us of our humanity and destroy our moral and spiritual fibers by, re by reducing us to mere objects, despicable ones to boot, according to the Bureau of Prisons. The state of helplessness that we suffer on a daily basis stifles and destroys our spirituality and our creativity. It's a terrible reality to be forced to spend 23 hours each day in a cement box, not knowing what's going to happen to us from one minute to the next. Not only are we denied every possibility of decision making, but also every creative opportunity. It's almost impossible to be creative when your main source of stimulation are the walls and the steel bars. Yet the little spark of spontaneity that we generate is destroyed by the jailers because they see it as a threat to their control and authority. Yes. Such a state of helplessness is made more pernicious because we are conscious that the water we drink is contaminated with lead and PCBs, yet we can't do anything about it. Well, allow me to wish you success with the commemoration activity. Uh, Oscar wrote this to us because we were having a big uh, day-long program commemorating the events of of Marion, and he said, please share my greetings with those who participate in it. <coughs> we didn't just hold educational events, we didn't just write things, although we probably had, write, wrote thousands of pages. We also organized many, many, many demonstrations. Some of them we would, on a weekend, go to two or three different prisons, but I'm going to read you one from a demonstration where we just went to Marion. But we started at Marion at 9. So now Marion is 350 miles away, so it took us a while to get there. We left very early in the morning or late at night. <laughs> and um, we demonstrated from 9 in the morning till 5 at night. We started at the SIU, Southern Illinois University campus. And we went, there's actually a federal building there. We went to the federal building and the post office to gain more visibility. We went to the lake because, as Oscar mentioned in his thing, we discovered that the water at the prison was, was toxic. And so that we, although our main goal was to end the lockdown, we also tried to focus in on other issues that we might more easily win. And that was one that we had a large campaign around. And then we went to um, the prison itself, as close as we could get. And then we went to downtown Marion, where we had this small town square, and we addressed the people of Southern Illinois. So the, this is a reading about how the media, the local media, reported it, because the local media would always cover our demonstrations, interestingly enough, except in Chicago. <laughs> but, um, and, and also a response from the prisoners themselves to the demonstration. So the Marion Daily Republican, which is the name of the Marion newspaper of May 1st, 1989, would later report that, quote, it was a hot day with the humidity reaching nearly unbearable proportions but that didn't stop the group from walking down the road leading to the prison, carrying two large signs that said, stop the lockdown at Marion Prison and abolish control units everywhere. There were two pictures side by side in the newspaper, captioned the action and the reaction. The action was a picture of us with our various banners, and the reporter described it in the following way. The nearly one is of the nearly 200 protesters who peacefully demonstrated at the U.S. Penitentiary Saturday, while the picture at the right shows what was waiting for the group. The Bureau of Prisons had closed the gate and set up the sign, U.S. Government Property, No Trespassing, telling the group that that was as far as they could go. The way was blocked by about a dozen armed Illinois state troopers. 
the, uh, the reporter Rob Wick described the composition of the group in the following way. The protesters were of every conceivable size, shape, color, or age. Many had the, the appearance of being old enough to have protested America's entry into World War I, while others were in diapers or not even thought about when America was in Vietnam. The majority were college students from around the state with some wearing t-shirts emblazoned with their alma maters. Okay. The reporter Rob Wick had no way of knowing how ironic his opening line was. The only thing, he quotes, the only thing missing was Abby Hoffman. And I smiled as I thought of my old friend from my Yippie days, because I was a Yippie. <laughs> That's why I don't mind the clown outfit. <laughs> On Monday, May 1st, the SIU student paper, the Daily Egyptian, reported that, quote, about 250 people from nine cities and seven college campuses throughout the Midwest converged in Carbondale to protest what they view as human rights violations at Marion Federal Penitentiary. They quoted Steve. Quote, we have people here who have been traveling 12 hours to get here. They've spent their own money and time because they care about justice in this country, end quote. I was quoted as stating that the prison is a dungeon where prisoners are treated like animals in a zoo. The final line of the story was, Julie Jones of Davenport, Iowa, said she and four friends drove all night to reach the Carbondale protest as a matter of principle. We have to oppose injustices wherever we find them, she said. But the most heartwarming response came from some of the prisoners themselves. <laughs> One prisoner wrote, Sorry. Thank you so much for this, the community and the Marion lockdown and all your efforts to end this painfully long lockdown. It's so good of you to not scatter and run when the Bureau of Prisons flexes its muscles and growls that there's no more lockdown, it's just high security. <coughs> Sorry. And oh, your rally and march. I apologize. And oh, your rally and march were the best thing that's happened in ages. Why were the guards so agitated all day, making rounds every 20 minutes so grim looking? The event was on all the channels, and you could hear the guys clicking stations, <clears throat> yelling out six, three, and so on. Those of you who spoke were cogent and forthright, and so you came across honest and concerned. It was most impressive. And we convicts really appreciated the collateral emphasis on the toxic drinking water. The prison mouthpiece who assured you all that he drank the same water is surely a liar. The drinking water jokes are an ongoing uh, sick joke game among the guards. It is a struggle sometimes to not get discouraged and resigned. Everyone knows that. I don't know who you folks have to encourage you uh, but we have you. Thank you very much. So, um, yes, honey. Yes. The work, the work was difficult, and it was it was an uphill battle, mm -hmm. and one that we fought with no money and no staff. We weren't even a nonprofit organization. We all had day jobs, so this was the second job. And our overreaching goal of eliminating control unit prisons, I sometimes say was a failure, but I, some people have criticized me for using that word, so I'll say they weren't a tremendous success. It wasn't a tremendous success. Um, because as I said, as we predicted, they proliferated. But we did have some victories. We, we along with many other people from around the country and also Puerto Rico, um, helped shut down the Lexington Control Unit for Women uh, in Lexington, Kentucky. Um, we also waged a successful campaign to end the toxic water at Marion. They fought us on that for years, and then finally, uh, 
Representative Cassidy Meyer in Wisconsin, who was one of the few allies we could ever find in Congress, helped us to get the water tested and it proved it was seriously toxic. And even though the science proved it was toxic, the prisoners, the prison said, it's not toxic, but we'll change it. So they did change the water at the, at the prison. Uh, and the toxicity, by the way, came from munitions plants in the area that had, you, you know, the, uh, the effects of the munitions production seeped into the ecosystem through the lake, etc. Um, and several political prisoners were moved out of Marion, and they attributed that to the fact that we were there all the time. And, I think they thought if they moved the political prisoners out, maybe we would go away. But there was something else that kept us going, that, and um, that was the amazing people that we met along the way, both inside and outside the prison. Uh, so, I you know, I was emailing back and forth with a friend of ours who is um, a radical priest yesterday and he said I just finished your book he said yeah the rewards were not many but they were great he said you know the rewards were basically uh, how did he say it loving loving people and living dreams so uh, I the, so I want to read you actually I'm going to ask Jay to read it I'm cheating here um, this is about Josefina Rodriguez, who was the mother, is the mother of two women who were Puerto Rican political prisoners, and um, their sentences were commuted by President Clinton in 19, I don't remember, about a dozen years ago. <laughs> um, and this is about Bifo, her daughters, and my daughter, and my experience with them. Thanks, Jane. So this is something that Rosa, Nancy's daughter, wrote after visiting, right? The most powerful in-your-face lessons for me as a child growing up were visits to prison. Most often, I visited Lucy and Alicia Rodriguez. For many years, I could get in to visit without being on a list because I was with my mother, Nancy. Entering prison always felt strange, being patted down and searched by metal detectors. The impersonal nature of the visiting room was chilling. I had a profound feeling of leaving the outside world behind. But then there were the prisoners, our friends. At each visit, they began by asking about me, how was school, how everything was going. I thought they must have more important things to talk about with my mom, but I was always a big focus. Children and the future they could bring were so vital to them. I could feel the joy I brought them at every visit. Then we would leave, go through the whole security rigmarole, walk out a locked door and be cleared through an area, get our stuff out of the lockers, and they would be taken back to their cells. And we would walk out through the barbed wire back into the free world, and I knew something was really wrong. Our friends were the nicest, most genuine, most dedicated and caring people. They asked me about school and life and were sincerely curious about who I was becoming. They were in prison for fighting for freedom. I got to walk out free, and they could not walk out with me because they were forced to stay inside those walls for decades on end. If they were the ones called terrorists, something was terribly wrong. <clears throat> so I'm just going to read you one more paragraph that speaks to what sustained us in the 15 years. It's a reflection of our work, um, and it talks about one particular demonstration where we had been to two, two earlier prisons that day, and it, we had been in a major downpour, so we, were, we had been sopping wet. 
Hmm? Now I'm, I'm trying. <laughs> Remember, Rafael Cancel Miranda was the man who was early on involved in that work stoppage, was um, <clears throat> pardoned by uh, Carter, and was out of prison. So he appears in this. The fir that first event of ours led to 15 years of the committee and the Marion lockdown. 15 years of demonstrations with bus caravans that lasted 48 hours and 15 years of paying for all of this out of our own pockets with little enough in them to begin with. But as far as I am aware, no one ever doubted our mission or regretted our work, and frequently magical moments entered our lives. You might know some of these people, you might not. I apologize if you don't. Dinner with Lolita Lebron or Judge Bruce Wright. Weekends with Mort Sobel and David Dellinger, demonstrating alongside Josefina Rodriguez and Rafael Cancel Miranda. And yes, visiting in prisons with Alejandrina Torres and Sundiata Akoli. One time, I recall picketing at USP Terre Haute in the rain. I was soaked to the core. My feet hurt, and I just wanted to get the hell home and rest. By coincidence, Rafael was walking beside me. He put his hand on my shoulder and said, thanks for making this happen. It's great to be here, isn't it? And I knew for sure that it was indeed great to be there, soggy and all. Okay, so that... Uh, Let's thank our... I, 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 I want to apologize because I, I, there was so much, you know, ado and everything going on mm -hmm. that I forgot to thank everybody here. Um, I thought I was just going to be thanking Charles, but I realized from being here that this is a group effort. And I'd like to thank Charles, Andy, Brahm, Tim, and everybody else who I don't know your names that are clearly are a part of this gathering, and including the Lincoln Restaurant. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tim's first question. Can you please explain exactly what a control unit prison is and why they have proliferated so much? Oh, Robin. Hi, hi. Bill. Hi. Hi, Nancy. Oh, pals. Hi. Could you start over, please? <laughs> <laughs> you were there. It, it, no. It's on the tape. You could, uh... <laughs> um, so, control unit prisons are basically prisons where a man or a woman is in an individual cell 23 hours a day for an indeterminate amount of time. The prisoner doesn't know exactly often why or how they got in there and really doesn't know how they're going to get out. Um, there's no, I said some of this, but there's no natural air, no light. Um, there's the food, it comes through a slot in the door. And this is this is what Marion was like. So there's some variation, of course. Um, visiting is over plexiglass with a telephone. And it's monitored by guards fitting, sitting a couple of feet away. Uh, basically, it's severe sensory deprivation. And, I mean, psychologists have studied this. It's not at all rehabilitative. You know, People need social contact, and that's how people change in a positive way through social contact. I, I was a social worker for 20 years in the Chicago public schools, and I can tell you putting, putting people in isolation is not a way to solve any problems. It just creates more problems. On the second note, why have they proliferated so much? Uh, you, I, I think that they have proliferated. Well, the, the whole system has proliferated. The whole mass incarceration thing has just exploded over the last, what, 20 years. Um, and I, I believe what I said initially, that prisons in general are functioning quite well if you think the purpose of them is, to, is, the, is the social control of people of color. And I think that the, the control units are just sort of the capstone on that situation. So, you know, you put people into prisons that aren't that great. I, I mean, I didn't talk about generally, especially maximum security prisons aren't all that great. 
Um, and you have things like the beating of a Mexican prisoner, for instance, and you have race, racist guards in some cases. There's just all kinds of abuses that go on in, in prisons, and then prisoners do respond because if you, you know, kick even an animal, they're going to kick back, and I think that's what happens in the prison. So in 72, a response was a work stoppage, and that was unacceptable, so they had to figure out how to stop people from having work stoppages. Rather than attend to the actual demands or the, the, the problems in the prison, they just further, they create further punitive situations. And I think that's what's happening in California. Um, so I don't know. And then Andy. Okay, thanks. Okay, I have a question. Yeah. Okay, please excuse my English. Because my English, first language. No problem. Good. Okay, I thank you so much. Um, what? Fifty percent. Yeah, give her the mic. No, I don't want the mic. Okay. Fifty percent. I agree with you, sir. Okay. Okay. I That's sometimes I feel for those people, right? But fifty percent, I absolutely disagree. Because if person commit crime, okay, they're supposed to be punished. And special, even for political reason. Okay, if they interrupt like social uh, behavior, okay, or do something, uh, even physically attack a policeman or uh, people, law enforcement, uh, who work very hard sometimes to, you know, to handle those people, then those people supposed to be punished. And judge, you know, who prosecute them, he know what he do, okay, and. I pretty much disagree, you know, 50%, like you talk about this woman who, whatever she did it, if, if they did it, if, 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 if criminal did it, then they deserve to be in position what they have special murderers, special, you know, really hard What's women. the question? Uh, actually, it's common, and I would like asking, what do you think about my remark? Thank you. Do I? I'm just confused about. So do I respond to each question? Yes. And okay. Well, however you wish to respond. Right. 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 But I don't wait till everybody talks. No, no. You, you respond to each okay. question. Okay. Okay. So I, you know, we we could get into a long discussion about each step of the way because, you know, what's a crime and what isn't a crime changes in this country. I mean, no, for, in crime, whatever they seem for, then obviously <coughs> nobody picked them up from the street. And they did something wrong, and they're supposed yes. to punish. Right, but I'm just saying, they, they did it wrong. right, but what what is right and wrong changes, from one not from one day to the next, but over time, right? Just so, let me give you an example. It's not one you would even think of, but it used to be, abortion used to be illegal. Now it, now it's legal. So what was a crime then isn't a crime now, in, in some places at least. <laughs> uh, that might change again. But so uh, what we mean by crime changes. The other, but, uh, but also so many crimes are crimes, economic crimes. Like if we address the real issues of the crimes, the real problems in society, we wouldn't necessarily have a lot of those crimes. A lot of crimes are victimless crimes. Give me an example. Um, yeah, smoking marijuana. I mean, who's the victim? They smoke marijuana in their own house and they don't harm nobody Next physically. Then it's crime. I, I am agree. <laughs> but they don't harm. They maybe don't go outside and go be bazaar. No. You know, right. I know. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. It's a victimless crime. Or if you, and then the way that, the crime, you but, the, you but, the but crime. everybody, people, black people and white people might do the same crime, but they get different time. That is a fact. Like, for instance, the, the prosecution for crack cocaine versus powder cocaine is very different. The, the penalties are very different. And different, and, and powder cocaine is used by white people 
crack cocaine is used by black people. The penalties have been severely different in imprisonment. But you're talking about the breeds in, in the Brown, place where they are. Right. Okay, right. great. Uh, it's supposed to be like that. Because they yeah. That's enough. Okay. Let me just say one final thing to this point. But let me just say, even if we were to accept that uh, crime never changes, it's just this thing that we know is bad and it's not disproportionately um, it's not applied disproportionately black, white, let's say, all that. People are sentenced to go to jail, to prison. They go to prison. That's their penalty, going to prison. Not being locked in a cage 23 hours a day. That, that is, a, that is a, a, a punishment within a punishment, and it's not done even by a jury or a judge or anybody. It's by some prison bureaucrat who doesn't necessarily have anybody's interest at heart. So that would really be my response. All right, Andy. I had a question. Um, could you, did the, the rise of a, a building a lot of prisons have anything to do with the privatization of prisons, the profit motive? That, uh, do you, are, are the number of prisons in America that are privatized, are they relatively small? Or is this... Is no, this like, no. They're, they're not small. I, but I don't... I mean, imprisonment rates skyrocketed, and most of that was public, you know, prisons run by the government. But there also are private prisons, and, you know, they're very unmonitored, and they're, it's terrible to think that a profit is being made on the misery of all these people. So, you know, I mean, I'm totally against private prisons, but even if they were all public, they would be a problem. They're a problem. I, I just I was asking if the profit motive was driving the, the uh, mill more the incarceration, because you get so much money for prisoner, and they fill these prisons and make a profit. And the, prison, the prisons tend to be capacity-driven. You know, they build them, and then they, have, they want to fill them. And to that extent, that's true. Um, it, uh, unfortunately, it, these building of the prisons also serves to provide jobs for, and, and in many cases it's for um, rural communities, you know, and a lot poor white people who can't get jobs in any other way. And you have to just hate a society which gives young people or even older people the only options for work are the military or prison guards. I mean, it's a terrible state. You're welcome. Thank you. Hey, Nancy, I wanted to ask, uh, I wanted to ask more about that, whether you've had any conversations with uh, AFSCME, the uh, um, American Federation of State Municipal and whatever, county employees, about this issue, if that's something you're willing to talk about. <laughs> Yeah, this is actually a part of my book that talks about that specifically. So we, <laughs> I don't know if I should try to find it, but we did have interaction with them. Um, the son of one of the plowshares uh, women, Joe Gump was his name, um, was in AFSCME, and he was part of the regional AFSCME not, or part of the local asked me, I think, and he was very much concerned about the prison issue, and he set up a meeting with us with, um, I forget the guy's name, but the, Bayer, his, Henry Bayer, who is the regional asked me guy, and it did not go well. <laughs> I mean, they, they defend the, you know, they'll, they'll just, they're just in defense of the prison guards, that's what they do. You know, they, he, they, even though I think on his wall he had a picture of Martin Luther King or something, he got very defensive of, uh, of us criticizing what was going on inside the prisons. So I'd say, you know, on the more, not surprisingly, on the more grassroots level, I think people were in this region supportive, but not as we went up the ladder. Uh, some people, when they look at a social problem, think it's uh, the system, and some people think it's the individuals. Are you saying they're a bunch of mean guards, or do you think this system is rotten? 
<laughs> I think the system is rotten. Thank you. <laughs> there might be some mean guards, though. No doubt there are. But there are probably also some good ones. He he is was part of the revolutionary independence movement for Puerto Rico, and they, he was convicted of uh, seditious conspiracy. Never hurting anyone. Conspiracy, yeah. Thirty-two years. What happened? It's a little bit complicated. Um, what Clinton Clinton pardoned all his sort of co-defendants, and Oscar was offered a deal. Well, not all. Clinton pardoned most of them and left a few of them in prison, and and didn't offer them a deal. And so Oscar turned down the deal. He said he wasn't going to go out of prison if his his uh, his uh, co colleagues, that's the compañeros, and, um, weren't also released. So he turned down the deal. Meanwhile, everybody else is out, and he's still in. But Obama, you know, Obama is the non-pardon president. He's done less pardoning than any president ever. Uh, I'll get you some more that was the nationalists. That was a previous right. previous group. Uh -huh. An older generation. Al, you had a question? Yeah, I'm Bill. Uh, yes, uh, excuse me for arriving late, so you may have already covered this. Uh, have you spoken about uh, what's going on in California now? A little bit. The hunger strike? But I could speak about it a little bit. I said because it's a current <laughs> relative parallel situation. Right. I mean, one of the reasons I wrote the book was because I knew that the hunger strike was coming because they had had two shorter hunger strikes before this hunger strike. Um, but um, I just have a, I somewhere here real fast. I, mean, I have a couple of statistics about the California hunger strike, if I can find them. Oh, God. Sorry. Okay. Um, so this is in California. Okay. So I said in, on any given day in the country, 80,000 people are in solitary confinement. In California alone, there are, this says 2,000, but I think it's more like three or 4,000 people who are in solitary. And in July of this past year, 30,000 prisoners began a hunger strike. It lasted two months. Um, in, in California, 500 people have been in solitary confinement for 10 years. 200 people have been in solitary confinement for over 15 years. 78 people have been in, con in solitary confinement for over 20 years. The Geneva Accords, the Geneva Convention forbids these conditions. Even in Abu Ghraib, jailers had to get permission of their commanding general to keep someone in isolation for more than 30 days. And Amnesty International has condemned the situation. The UN Rapporteur has condemned the situation. The prisoners called off the hunger strike with the promise that there would be hearings held. A couple of the progressive Congress state legislators said they would hold hearings because they, people didn't want to see them start to die. One person did die at the end of the hunger strike. He had underlying health conditions, but he did die as a result of the strike. And um, now we'll see what happens. They just finished the hearings. Um, it's not clear yet whether they've really moved people out of solitary. They've punished some of the leaders of the strike. And it was a, you know, it was a hunger strike. It wasn't a violent uprising. Anyway, so that's to the hunger strike. And I actually have cards about that. I passed them all. Oh, I have cards that has the website of the, yeah, and people can find out more information about that. All right, other questions? Uh, Dan, uh, Dr. Dan. I, I, uh, would you say that, um, how a society treats 
how a society treats its prisoners, sick, elderly, would, would be how the society is. Should be judged. Should be judged. <laughs> I would. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, uh, Carl Schurt. Um, would also one of the underlying causes for this uh, rate disparity, disparity in uh, the racial uh, quantities, numbers, is that they're not able to afford uh, good legal counsel? Right. Sure. I mean, public defenders are notoriously, you know, overloaded and they meet their client when they're going out. It's, and they don't, it's not that they're doing anything wrong. They're doing the best they can by and large, but they're pretty difficult situations. But I also think the economics create it, don't you think? I mean, I think a lot of it goes back to the economic situation in this country. Yeah. Otherwise, if you think that it, if you think that it's normal for more black people to be in prison than white people, why would you think that? Either it's genetic, that, that there's something that leads black people to do terrible things, or there's something in society, the structure of society, that allows that situation to exist. Let's see, Ed uh, Rios. I remember many questions, but with the line of what just said. I remember once Bill Cosby complaining about a culture where other African Americans would say to an African American in school who was studying, why are you be behaving white? And it's, it indicated to me that there was a, a, re, a deep rebellion going on, which would be fruitless, because without an education, you, it's, your future is very limited. I, I and I, I really haven't come up with a, a sol not a solution, but I haven't come up with a deep, an understanding of this culture that does not value education. You know? Does our culture value education for everyone? Our culture being. I mean, are we funded like? Are the public schools in Chicago being funded like they should be? Are teachers being paid? Are, are, are they about to strip people's pensions back? Are, you know, I mean, I, I don't think, uh, are, can you compare the city schools to the suburban schools? The amount of money we spend on every kid in, in the city of Chicago versus what we spend on kids in the suburbs? Are or is spent? Are you asking me a question? What? Instead of answering mine, are you asking me questions? It's a well, it's question. rhetorical. I don't agree with Bill Cosby. I'm not saying I don't agree with Bill Cosby. That's probably how I should have answered it. <laughs> That's good. Uh, Charles? Yeah, it, many years ago, we had a speaker, and the prison population was at one million. That's why they spoke. And what is the number? Well, how many people are in prison at any given day you know, two, in the United two, States? 2.3. 2.3. Isn't, isn't that equal to the rest of the world combined? We are the incarceration nation. I mean, our when we started crunching the numbers even back then, if you look at the numbers, the white imprisonment rates in this country are comparable to what they are in Europe, or they were. I don't really know the update of them. But it's the black in prison, it's the, pe the people of color, black and Latino imprisonment rates that forces our rates to be so much higher than in other European nations. Doesn't China com compete with us in this? Uh-uh. No. Uh-uh. And they just shut down, they just shut down some whole thing I read in China. In communist countries, there's no crime. What? In communist countries, there's no crime. Oh, well, I yeah, don't know right. about that. <laughs> but I was recently in Vietnam, and I, I couldn't really get any statistics, but everybody you asked said, 
the crime rate is low. It, they, they think that it's probably going to go up because disparities may be going up because it's becoming more of a market economy. But um, it, there really has been a low crime rate there. I mean, it, even in people's... Because, you know, if people in this country are aware of crime. They, people will tell you if they're afraid to leave their doors open or, you know, whatever. And in Vietnam, you know, it, it was, it, it was a very low crime rate. Well, I, I just would like to make two comments. Is that okay? Yeah. One is people. Well, that's <coughs> end with a question. Of no. Oh, okay. no. Let him comment. Come on. Okay. okay. Isn't it, Miss Kershan? Isn't it true? <laughs> Come on, be okay. silly. Okay. The, the people have asked about, asked me, and I guess unions in general. And just let me say that uh, in Illinois, I'll stand up. In Illinois, ASME has been one of the great advocates of increasing uh, imprisonment, putting more and more people into prison, and in fact, building control unit prisons. So when, ASC, when the state of Illinois was considering building a control unit prison, and then they decided to build it in southern Illinois in the town of Tams, uh, I was the one who went to see Henry Bayer and are, you know, introduced by this other person asked me and, and I, I didn't get anywhere and, and Bayer just kept insisting it was a good thing. And all around, because it was asked me, there were pictures of Martin Luther King, of Cesar Chavez and everybody else. And I don't know if anybody knows Bayer, but he's a huge guy. And um, I said to him, well, Mr. Bayer, you know, you have the pictures of Martin Luther King and Cesar Chavez on the walls. How do you think they would feel about you building this control unit prison? And he shoved me back, and he really would have beaten me to a pulp had this other guy not stepped in between us. Just recently, now, after about 10 years, Governor Quinn went to shut down TAMS because it's so expensive and so counterproductive and so destructive of human beings. And the single biggest, most strenuous opponent to closing the TAMS control unit, the TAMS Supermax prison in Illinois, has been asked me. And just one other example, in California, the single biggest funder, the single biggest funder of the campaign of Jerry Brown has been the Guards Union. And now, even though the courts of Alabama have so, ordered Jerry California. Brown... California. The California, thank you, Mary. Have have ordered Jerry Brown to let prisoners out because it's too overcrowded and the conditions are too inhumane, he's refused. And the reason he's refused is because the guards union is pressuring him not to let people out. Because if he lets they're, people out... They're big they, contributors to his campaign. They're the leading contributors to right. his campaign. So, so those unions, at least, have been extraordinarily... Um, reactive and conservative in encouraging greater incarceration. And I, the, then the other point, is it all right if I just go on? Yes, please. So the other point I would like to make came up from an earlier question. I mean, we, I, I think it's important to understand how the nature of crime changes all the time. And then who gets sent to prison is a function of those definitions. For example, we all know the story about how alcohol was illegal. And hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of people were sent to prison because of alcohol rules. Now, more than half of the prisoners in the United States are there on rules, on laws associated with drugs. The drugs are changing, the drug laws are changing all of the time. It's not, in many states, marijuana is no longer illegal or is becoming not illegal and we all know that soon it won't be. But what about literally the tens and even hundreds of thousands of people who are in prison because of marijuana? That will no longer be the case. And we can go on and on and, uh, uh, around that. I mean, for example, virtually no one goes to prison for DUI, driving um, while under the influence of alcohol, and yet petty drug offenses, like for example marijuana use, uh, uh, people have picked up all the time and almost overwhelmingly in communities of color. 
So again, that impacts on another question, how do they, why are there so many people uh, of color in prisons? And, and this arbitrary definition of what's a crime has to do with that. Okay. Uh, there's quite a, a response there. Okay. Would you like me to go on for a while? <laughs> Let's see. Uh, other questions? Uh, yes, Ed? I just was curious if we had a similar situation to what exists in Europe, would you then be happy with the with people who do commit crimes being put, being isolated, being separated from the community in an appropriate way at appropriate rates? Uh, probably yes. I mean, I. You know, I would prefer not to see anyone in prison. Yeah, I would. But, you know, I wouldn't spend my life combating that situation. I, you know, I might be a social worker, which I was, but I wouldn't be completely opposed. You said in appropriate ways. That's, you know, that's a loaded word. We'd have to figure out what appropriate ways were. Um, one, one last question. If you were the head of the Bureau of Prisons today, what would you do to reform the shutting down and what would you say would be an example of a good model prison? Well look, it, it's actually happening in some, I, I, I'm not going to talk about a good model prison, but I would end the practice of indeterminate solitary confinement, long-term solitary confinement. I would end that. Maybe it would have to be used briefly, you know, like I can't remember what the rule is for little kids, but like when they're three years old, you're not supposed to, or four years old, put them in isolation. Maybe you could put them in a room for five minutes when they're a couple of years older, but you know, it's just not good for people. It's just not a, a, a good response. Um, so, and, and actually the state of Mississippi, I think it is, is no longer doing it. Um, we, sh Illinois, Governor Quinn shut down TAMS. That was our controlling the prison in Illinois. And I like to think he did it for some moral reasons. Um, there's been a campaign here for years by a, a group of people in Chicago, a TAMS campaign. And um, I think you know, it, there's been openings because it's so expensive to run these prisons that some places are letting go of that now. Because you could send someone to Harvard for the price of a, sending them to a control unit prison. So not a very good use of money. So I, I think there's lots of things that could be done. I think resources could be put toward education in the prison. There's, there's very little programming in the prisons now. There should be educational programming, skills training, all kinds of, th I think there's no dearth of things that could be done, but there has to be the will to do it. You know, people have to be willing to put some resources in that direction and not just consider everybody, all those people to be throwaway people. Uh, Ileana? <clears throat> I can't wait to ask this question. But I would like to ask anyway, are you willing to visit Rad Blagojevic? Uh, willing to what? Are you willing to visit Rad Blagojevic? Is he asking me to visit him? <laughs> I asked, are you considering to visit Rad Blagojevic? I hadn't considered it. Should I? No. <laughs> How about let's go to Reba? Is there any evidence, Nancy, that putting somebody in a control unit um, decreases recidivism? No. And it doesn't even... There's no evidence that it decreases violence in a prison. I just actually I just read something about that today. I guess they've acknowledged in California that they don't know if it does or it doesn't. They don't, you know, so much of this stuff is not really science. They just do it's it. just punishment and for the sake of it. Okay. This is the question back there. Oh.
Uh, Russell, is there any uh, evidence that what's going on in the prisons with all these gangs running things is a program by the prison authority to use the gangs to help control matters? Many, many people think that the prisons foment friction between the gangs. Yes, I believe that. And in fact, in this hunger strike, it crossed lines. Like there were um, black, Latino, white hunger strikers. They were united. And they issued a call to the prisoners to join together and not fight each other and to join the hunger strike, which I thought was, was very interesting. Mm -hmm. And if, if you were running the prisons and you really were running a rehabilitative program, wouldn't you think that would be a great thing when you embrace those leaders of that prison, the hunger strike, and say, how can we, you know, advance this? But no, they didn't. In fact, they punished the leaders of the hunger strike. And it was definitely cross-racial boundaries. So I, yes, I think that goes on all the time in the prisons, fomenting of those problems. For the benefit of those who have not been attending regularly, uh, we have a system of uh, lining up uh, over on these chairs here. I see that uh, Dave Travis has already uh, appropriated the first uh, rebuttal uh, chair, uh, and uh, there are two others uh, vacant there. Uh, if you want to uh, give a statement to the rest of us, uh, how many, I have to ask how many people uh, have such a statement to make, or might, will one, two, three, Four, five, six, a lot of time. Seven, eight. Uh, yeah. About six, five, seven minutes eight. from it. Five minutes. Uh, yeah, up to five minutes. And uh, Tim will measure the time and uh, let you know uh, a minute before uh, your, uh, your, after four minutes. Uh, let's see. No, I'll, I'll just give a timeout. What are we doing? Oh, All right. Okay, it's um, the rebuttal period. It's the rebuttal period. Get up and it's time to sound off. Why not? Okay. Are you sure? All right. All right. Let's thank our speaker. Some of you guys belong in a control unit. <laughs> no, yeah. I'll give it a little one. All right, David. David, what are you Okay. Uh, I'm putting together a gang, and uh, we're going to bust Whitey Bulger out of prison. Who wants to join my gang? Okay, I got one recruit over here. Anyway, uh, in a more serious vein here, uh, I'd like to say that um, in the uh, prison system, a uh, uh, in, in our system, a, every time a marriage is performed, they say that the two are one. And so, if a man is incarcerated in prison, his wife, since she's not guilty of anything, doesn't go to prison. But by the same token, since she is also her husband, then she should have a right to freely come and go in and out of the prison so that she can cohabitate with her husband. This is only fair, just, and equitable. I think this practice occurs in certain other countries. Brazil. And so I think that this would greatly eliminate uh, or reduce the rampant homosexuality that uh, occurs in many of the prisons. That's a, uh, a reform 
that is highly overdue in, in our prison system. Uh, and our speaker, uh, who I thought gave a very good presentation, uh, she seemed to take a very dim view on anyone making a profit on the misery of the uh, inmates. But what she doesn't seem to realize is that these capitalist organizations that uh, have uh, uh, arranged for uh, convicts to do work in the prison, that they learn skills so that a, a prisoner that is in there, having learned a skill, when he gets out, can go and work. He can get a job as a, a, a mill writer, a woodworker or something. Uh, and, and so this is good for the, the convicts. Uh, she, and, and I see nothing wrong with these capitalist organizations making money on doing that. Because, as I say, it's good for the, for the convicts. So, uh, 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 I thought it's one fool at a time, sir. Would you rather come up here and talk? Oh, oh okay, then talk to him. Anyway, uh, so as I was, <laughs> as I was uh, saying, uh, I think that that uh, would be the better thing. And they're not forced to do it. They can uh, volunteer to do it or volunteer to sit in their cell, which they otherwise would be doing. So I think most, most uh, convicts would be glad to learn a trade, be useful, and do things. Uh, otherwise, they uh, have to resort to uh, building bird cages like uh, the Birdman of Alcatraz did and things like that. Uh, everybody has a need to be useful and to do things uh, that are um, creative. So, with what our speaker has said, that um, these control unit things, I, I think that's a bad thing for the, for the um, to have. And that uh, it should be pretty much equal for all the people. And it's not. Black people do get a um, stiffer sentences, longer sentences, and and um, and that sort of thing. And, and I think that uh, if you do an armed robbery against someone, it doesn't matter what your color is. Your sentence should be such, no matter who has committed that crime, whether it's a black person a white person, a Puerto Rican person, or, uh, or whatever. Uh, you stick somebody up, you deserve to go to prison, and if you get caught, you get sentenced. The sentence ought to be the same for everyone who does that. Not 10 years for a black person, but five for a white person. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, my time is up, and so I hope that uh, I've um, been useful here. Well, thanks. It was a very interesting presentation. Uh, I had the idea that I've gotten from various books that uh, punishment is a, not a real good way to change people's behavior. Uh, we've had in our uh, midst here at the College of Complexes at least four people that spend a lot of time in the clink, including Brad Little, who uh, got it for peace activities. Um, uh, we also had, I don't know if anybody remembers this, but in this, my recollection isn't real clear, but we had a guy here who uh, was in uh, prison for murder, uh, who was a speaker. I'm not talking about J.J. Jameson, but I know we had a speaker and uh, he pretty much said, hey, uh, after his experience of many years in the prison, he didn't think the prisons were any good to change behavior or help people at all. Uh, Michelle Alexander in her book, uh, The New Jim Crow, one of the things she said, is, uh, which was very interesting to me, I kind of agree with it, 
uh, society decides how much punishment they will have. Uh, for some reason, Finland does, has a similar, according to her, uh, a similar uh, crime rate in the United States, but they have way less people in prison. Why is this? This is a good question. At 2U, we're a uh, second Unitarian. We've got a uh, prisoner solidarity group, and uh, we're uh, learning something about uh, prisoners. I'm not on that group, but I hear from them all what's uh, going on. I also wanted to discuss real quickly uh, a DVD I saw about Secrets of the Dead, uh, I'm not saying this is a perfect system, but in World War II, the Brits uh, put a bunch of Nazis in prison. Well, did they torture them and beat the hell out of them? Put them in isolation? No. They took care of them and made sure they had enough food. They were confined, uh, but they also had listening devices all over the place. And they found out exactly what the uh, Nazis were doing. A very creative way to handle punishment. I'm not saying this is a perfect system, but I'm saying that one of the things we need more is creativity. Why do we have all these people in prison? And why the hell am I as a taxpayer uh, paying this money and uh, the system is no good? Thank you. Thank you very much. And she, I thought that was um, really interesting, Nancy, and I do plan to buy your book, and, and I also plan to read it. Um, I just had a few things that came to me. There, there used to be a card making the rounds that said, it is equally illegal for the rich man and the poor man to sleep under a bridge. So that's one thought I had. And then um, there's a poem by, I think by Carl, I think by Carl Sandburg has a poem about the fact that you can rob a bank from the inside or you can rob a bank from the outside and the consequences of the two are vastly different. <laughs> and then there was a story in the reader um, a few years ago that the um, author did not seem to see the pattern in it that I did, but it were, there was a young man who was left alone, no experience as a parent, I think he was about 18, left alone to take care of a small child and uh, the child started to misbehave. So this 18-year-old boy hit him hard, killed the child. So the prosecutor decided that this guy should go to prison. And he said he should go to prison so that nobody would ever do that to a child again. Of course, we all know that that's not going to be the result of that. But So the, the man hit the child for misbehaving, the, the, the prosecutor sent the young man to jail for misbehaving, and then the young man was put in a minimum security place and he escaped somehow. So one of the people who was in charge of that place was then fired for this. I mean, I think there's a pattern there that the writer of this article didn't see, and I think we can all see that none of this is going to be productive of anything good. I'm Michael Foley. I have to mention a few things tonight, and it's important to remember that these things are legal and lawful right now under the laws of our country. The president can declare any person a terrorist and have government employees kill the person. It is all legal and lawful. I call my program One Brain, One Bullet. This ain't rocket science. There is no reason to put anyone in jail for more than five years. It is time for judges to start earning their money. If a guy commits a crime, the judge has to figure out if the guy can straighten himself out in five years or less. If so, Give the guy the time, three years, four years, five years. If the judge figures that the guy won't straighten out, even in five years, tell him right there, blow his brains out right in the court. 
Make the judge do it. <laughs> Same thing if a guy has committed a crime that is so horrible that he has to be removed from our midst. Kill him right there. That brings us to plea bargains. Plea bargains are a bribe extracted through torture. It is a bribe that is solicited by a prosecutor and it has to be approved by a judge. If a state's attorney says to a guy, hey, you give me a hundred bucks and we'll go easy on you, that's a bribe. If the state's attorney says, hey, you give me a guilty plea and we'll go easy on you, that's a bribe. It's just that simple. It's bribery, one way or another, and it has to be approved by the judge. Any prosecutor and any judge who are involved in a plea bargain are terrorists. Kill them right now. It is all legal and lawful because the president can declare any person a terrorist and have them killed by government employees. Plea bargain prosecutors and plea bargain judges are terrorists. They are attacking our society, our culture, and our economy. They are attacking us. Prosecutors who take bribes and the judges who approve these bribes, even if it's called a plea bargain, they are attacking us, they are terrorists, and we should kill them right now. As far as... Hey, Charlie, shut your fucking mouth, asshole. As far as people who are killed... As far as people who are in prison right now, if a guy is over 40 years old, kill him. He is a terrorist who is attacking our economy. He is using up our hard-earned money for food, clothes, heat, air conditioning, whatever. But when the guy gets out of jail, the guy gets out of jail over 40 years old, he's got no future. We're going to have to support him anyway. We're going to have to give him some kind of public housing and food and everything. So if a guy's in jail and he's over 40 years, kill him right now. And if a guy's under 40 years old, take his age and add the number of years he's got left on his sentence. And if that comes out to be in over 40 years, then kill him. And I don't mean, I don't mean none of this parole stuff. A guy gets sentenced to 150 years in jail and he goes to prison, he's eligible for parole in six weeks. So take the guy's age, add how many years he's got left on his sentence, and if it comes to be over 40 years, just get rid of him, kill the guy. Remember, these people are terrorists. Criminals, plea bargain prosecutors, and the judges who approve the plea bargains they're attacking us, they're attacking our society, they're attacking our culture, they're attacking our economy, they're attacking us. They are terrorists. They can be killed by government employees and it's all legal and lawful. That's all I got. Thank you. Hi. Uh, uh, no. My name my name's Anthony Rice and uh, I run the South Chicago ABC Zine Distro and I've, I I live about 60 miles away but I came here tonight because I, I respect Nancy's work. As a matter of fact, I still distro one of her pamphlets entitled Women in Imprisonment in the U.S. History and Current Reality. How's that? Okay, now say you What I do, I work directly. It's your fucking turn, asshole. What's the little time? Look, can you give me a roll? I'm, I'm, I'm a bad guy, too. Anyway, uh, I work directly with prison writers and artists, publish their work, and get it back into the prisons. I'm a prison abolitionist. I think it's a, an insane idea to imprison somebody to make something better. If a guy stuck his kid in a doghouse or a closet and was found out he was doing this, he'd be the most hated guy in the neighborhood. It's insane to, to think that by hurting and punishing someone, something good is going to come of it. There's studies that came out, people that beat their kids, that does not help their kids, okay? It's pretty simple. Now this is a profit-driven punishment industry that's gone wild, gone on fire. And it is going into privatization. We have problems down in the southern suburbs, they're trying to shove a, a a regional immigration detention prison down our throats in these little towns down there. We stopped them in Crete, we stopped them in Joliet. Now they're rearing their ugly head in Holbert, Indiana. So 
So this is what this country is coming to. It is incarceration nation. As far as the uh, the hunger strike or the, the prison st hunger strikes, uh, I was involved in the behind the scenes organizing for the uh, 2012 wave of hunger strikes that that roared through California. And shortly before that, it happened in Georgia. But that built up to this bigger, huge, 30,000 prisoners. You know, several prisons, men and women, all kinds of detention camps all over the whole state, built into Nevada and Oregon, and you know, this thing's gonna get bigger and bigger. This is where the revolution is starting to happen right now. This is the black hole of this society, This, the, the prisons. It's insane to, to incarcerate 2.3 million of your young men, basically, and more and more women. You know, incredibly racially motivated. There's no, you know, all, every state in the country is going in the toilet, especially Illinois, perhaps. One of the big reasons is because they waste all the money on the prisons. There's nothing for them. Why would a, you say, why, why would a black kid act up and act like we want to read the, why would a black kid want to study in a white school while a four quarter of his relatives are being dragged off to prison all the time? Where's the black education that tells him about his heroes? You know, does he ever know, learn about who George Jackson was or Malcolm X or any of these revolutionaries from this country? You know, even even uh, when uh, Nelson Mandela just died. He, he wasn't just this kind, gentle guy. He hated America. America is the worst thing that's happened to this world in history. We have our foot on the neck of the whole damn world. We go around the world bombing and murdering people and incarcerating our own people and call it freedom. It's utterly insane. It's the opposite of what really is the reality in this country. This country is going down. It's going to be painful and it's going to cause a lot of suffering and death. But there's a growing resistance to this. A lot of young people are realize that there's no future for them in this country. This is a fascist country. And they're, they're learning how to resist. All kinds, like all the other countries that are revolting around the world, it's going to happen here. And more and more, these young, brilliant thinkers and, and writers and, and artists and leaders, they're in prison. They shove them into the control units. It's a, it, thought crimes are now enough to get people in, in control units. I work with these guys. They're my comrades. They're my friends. I go visit them. They're, they're being shoved into control units right and left. If they're, they have the strength and courage to educate those around them and tell them the truth, try to empower them and give them some self-respect and stand up for themselves against these brutes that are brutalizing them, oh, they're, they're, the, they're the criminal. Just like uh, Chelsea Man, uh, Manning got, what, 45 years for telling the world the truth about the atrocities day after day after day that this country inflicts on the rest of the world. Three billion people murdered in Indochina, 500,000 in Indonesia, hundreds of thousands throughout Central South America. I name a country, Chile, Guatemala, El Salvador, Nicaragua. What does that remind you of? U.S. atrocities, genocide that's caused by this government, and we're supposed to follow their damn laws? The Constitution to this day is a slave document. The 13th Amendment specifically authorizes slavery if you're a prisoner. We took a court case all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court from the Missouri Prison Labor Union because they were being treated like slaves out in the field. And the U.S. Supreme Court said, well, according to the 13th Amendment, they can treat you as slaves. This is what this country is all about, slavery, not freedom. Thanks. Thank you, Anthony. Anthony is a comrade of mine. I also am a prison abolitionist, but I'm also not only a prison abolitionist, but a punishment abolitionist. Because once you abolish prisons, then they'll start wanting to put you back in stocks or chop off your head or take off an arm or something like that. Uh, several years ago, I went to a, uh, a criminal law seminar, and they were talking about why they were uh, building these new prisons, and it was because there was a baby boom in the black and the Hispanic populations. And so they were preparing the prisoners, and you talk about why they skyrocketed? Well, they were being prepared, they were preparing the prisons, pre-preparing prisons for people who were going to grow up. And who were these people? They were blacks and Hispanics. So they had already criminalized them as children. They already had them criminalized. And, I mean, that, it's, it's when I, I grew up, I'm a baby boomer, they built schools for us, which were kind of like prisons, actually, but not as bad. Um, and so for the blacks and Hispanics, they got prisons. 
And now, of course, with the privatization, it is a lot about money, too. Uh, when Tams opened, there was this huge ribbon-cutting ceremony and rah rah ha ha. <laughs> and a few years ago, bye bye serendipity, I was driving through Tams accidentally, and I came upon it. And here's all these signs, you know, keep Tams, support Tams, because we don't want to lose our jobs. Keep it open. And then, an, and another mile away, there's this big pink horse and this big strip. It was like a strip bar. So it's like, okay, you can make money off of bodies through prison, or you can make money off of bodies through strip, stripping. Okay, so strip. Lets people get hurt, and it's, it's consensual. There's no, none of this coercion and force involved. So anyway, I'm with Anthony. I think that the whole United States justice, so-called justice uh, system, is a human, systemic human rights abuse, and it needs to be abolished, period. <laughs> dungeons are dungeons. So, and we talk, there's so much to say, but I, I, I want to talk about how we have this backward perception of who predators are because of uh, the media and, oh, this guy's a threat and that guy's a threat. But look at the prosecutors and the judges and the cops and, and all of and the, and the SWAT teams. These are the super predators. You know, there, there's no, you can't fight them. You know, they, you get involved, you talk about, oh, you did something wrong, you got to be punished. It's ridiculous. I mean, rich people don't go to jail. Punishment is reserved for you based on your color and on your class. If you have money and you've done something wrong, you never see it. You don't see any time. Rarely. Every now and then they'll throw somebody. But they don't get put into control units. You know, they go to club fed. So I'm with you, Anthony, and uh, down with prisons. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Andy Anderson, some of you know me. Um, I've given a few presentations here on things that you can get fired for writing about in America. Um, every city has its own short list of sacred cows, and it varies. <clears throat> I think what you talked about here tonight about um, the prison in Marion is one of the most successful things that the Chicago press has not covered over the last 30 years. Because I didn't know a lot about what you talked about and, I, and uh, with the censored news books I've been digesting for 20 years, I've seen very little talking about the Supermax, you know, what well, they were called Supermax prisons at one time and now they're control units, but it's the same thing. But uh, as I've said in all of my others, um, progress, you know, the human race moves forward uh, toward the truth. Once something is understood and learned, you can't really go back. Um, and the rate of progress varies from place to place depending on who's in charge. Um, the real terrorists uh, right now are uh, what the French uh, referred to as paper terrorists, the bankers, that just produce paper and then take people's property. And uh, you know, right now, uh, Charles Ferguson wrote a book called Predator Nation that talks about the billionaire predators that own and operate the people masquerading as our elected politicians. We don't have elected politicians in this country working for the people, by and large. They're paid, they're highly paid manservants of the billionaires behind the scenes who uh, their names are never mentioned. In 1971-72, uh, Telly Savalas, some of you may remember him from a project, uh, uh, he was called Kojak. <clears throat> and one of the comments, he used to close that show many times by saying, when will people learn, when, when will the leaders learn that where you have no justice, you get violence, one way or another. In 1980, uh, John Goffman wrote an article in one of the books, there were all kinds of protesters getting arrested protesting nuclear silos and nuclear power in general, uh, you know, pouring blood on some missiles here and there, and uh, the plowshares movement was part of it. And John Goffman, uh, in his article in a book called Adams, you know, The End of the Nuclear Age, his article was titled The Law Versus Justice. And in that article, he pointed out that American schools don't teach people <clears throat> that nothing illegal 
happened to the Jewish people and the, you know, the other people in Germany. They pass laws making everything legal. And then the schools taught people, well, you have to be a law-abiding citizen. You have to go along with the laws. And we have millions and millions of Americans today saying, well, uh, if it's legal, it must be okay. And the press, uh, the press does a fine job keeping evidence away from the public about what's really going on. Um, as, as many people, Michelle Alexander's new book uh, about uh, mass incarceration, you know, as it relates to black people, people of minorities, the prison industrial system, it has nothing to do with making Americans safer. Well, it has nothing to do with rehabilitation. It's all about controlling the population and in her book, several times she pointed out that for many people that get arrested, it's not about the crime. They don't care what crime you did or the time you get. It's about getting a felon label attached to you so when you can get out, now it's legal to discriminate. Uh, you know, this all started <clears throat> with the rise of Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement in the 60s. President Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, they were all assassinated by the powers that be. None of those people were killed by a lone nut gunman. It was the very powerful power brokers, billionaires behind the scenes that uh, took over our government. A, a coup was staged and our government was taken over and moved in a different direction by the billionaires working behind the scenes. And just at the moment where Martin Luther King and the others were talking about civil rights, workers' rights, minimum living wages, you know, making, fighting for the middle class, the middle class had been improving since 1945, the billionaires got together and says, you know, we, we can't have a thriving middle class, that's going to cut into our profits, and it won't make, uh, you know, society won't be a, a, a whole conglomeration of uh, compliant sheep that are struggling for survival and they have no time to protest. So the idea was to gradually get rid of the middle class and uh, turn America into, you know, uh, a handful, a few hundred thousand people, you know, super rich, and then no middle class except for uh, some a few professionals, teachers and policemen, firemen. But other than that, you know, the concept of a middle class has been going downhill since 1973. But. Goffman taught in his article, The Law Versus Justice, he said that's what they were trying to teach in the world in the Nuremberg trials, that just because something is legal doesn't mean it isn't a huge crime against humanity. And that should be taught. We have kids coming out of law school they had never heard of the Nuremberg trials. They, you know, they, they're just, uh, they're, they're moving forward, they're studying the law books, well, whatever is legal, you know, a whole bunch of bankers today and people on Wall Street are constantly like Enron. They said, well, if this is legal, if we can manipulate the market, we can make billions. Forget about whether it's a crime or not, or whether you're destroying people's lives. It's all about huge profits. Albert Einstein said, we're in a race between education and extinction. The human race, the human race is in an education between education and extinction, and he's not sure who's winning. <laughs> that was, you know, 50 years ago. And Tom Harbin, the last thing I would like to mention, Tom Harbin talks about this all the time. He said, in where you have a general equality in society, if you don't have a huge gap between rich and poor, those societies produce less violence than when you have enormous gaps between the poor and the rich. But like Kojak summed it up, he said, where you have no justice, you get violence. And that's where we're headed if we don't stand up as a society and do something about it. Thank you. Now, Tim Bolger. All right. I applaud your efforts to close down the Supermax prisons. It is unproductive to house human beings like this. What I did not hear tonight, though, was what makes for a good justice and good prison system. 
I've often said to myself, you know, I always get into like a lot of these people who are into global warming and climate change and problems with the technology and the so-called promise of renewables and for me none of them make sense you know I found a another alternate technology called nuclear powered thorium which I think is going to be the way that the world's going to go as far as our future energy is concerned and that's a viable alternative and a good one for solving our, our planet's green problems and in a similar way you know they're doing a lot of things in Europe and and I know that in the past they had used things like uh, you know work camps farms uh, rehabilitation programs many other things like that to, to, to take care of prisoners and I know a lot of times too they also serve as somewhat of a mental health center because of all the of all the mental health going down and I do know that people do not object to funds being spent for a prison but they do for education the thing that really gets to the crux of the matter though is I, I think our society just lost its moral compass over time. You know, one of the most effective rehabilitation books that I've ever read was from a gentleman by the name of Chuck Colson who went to prison for the Watergate scandal and he started something called the Prison Fellowship and has rehabilitated and changed lives of more prisoners by introducing them to Christianity. I don't know too much about Charlie. It's statistically proven, so shut up. Uh, you know, the thing is, is that, you know, again, he's got a viable alternative. What I, what I really want to bring down to the crux of the matter is that I wish you would look a little more into what constitutes a good working criminal justice system. And I know a lot of times, too, our own economy produces a, a lot of inequality and a lot of things. But on the other hand, you know, capitalism produces the goods, too. It's brought almost four-fifths of the world's population up and off the farm and into some jobs. But at the same time, it's produced a lot of inequality, made big corporations rich, and, and, and it fled to its own devices without some form of bankruptcy laws or other things can, can also be the greatest burden to society because you know when you do have rising inequality and this is advocated even by Robert Reich that there is a problem when it gets to be so bad that people will rebel in a recent book called from dictatorship to democracy and I spoke on this a few months ago generated by a small guy in Boston whose name uh, I'm, I'm sorry, my, his name forgets me right now. He talks about methods of protest and, and methods of, you know, going against the authority. And he also talks about other viable solutions to these problems. Now, as many people who think that America is a bad country and, and thinks that we're all out for things, yes, I agree, there are abuses. But at the same time, I also like what America yes, yes. stands for. Thank Freedom, you, equality, you, and even though we don't live up to the standard, we should at least as citizens try to be leading the way. I don't mean to, to preach here today, but if you're going to give a problem and outline it, try, please try to give us some kind of viable solution or at least a working model that will help us move forward. Thank you. Uh, All right, let's thank our speaker again. And I'm sorry I didn't get your name. You helped out too. The husband. All right, we'll leave at that. All right, I'll be eclectic as usual here. Um, it's not a topic I have as much depth as some of you folks who've been working at it for a number of years. Um, I, I often come to call to mind, I have a book by the attorney Clarence Darrow, and the entire book is why there should not be a prison at all in an ideal society. And he goes, that's about, it's an old book, uh, I think it's still available someplace. Mine is an older book that I picked up 
But uh, he says if you work it correctly, there no one should be incarcerated. In essence, there should be no occasion for crying. And that's what you should strive for. And maybe it seems like we're going in the other direction, thinking the more prisons or people we incarcerate will have a better society. There's, that's fallacious thinking. Um, my little exposure to the federal penal system is that I was a little bit involved in, well, I'll just, there were three levels, was my understanding, in the federal penal system. Uh, and they seem to have come along and added a fourth level. That's where you got the control units, I believe. There were the three, three levels of federal penitentiary. I was involved in Leavenworth and some other occasions locations, but they've added the fourth level, and that's where this came from, and it certainly merits resisting when, you know, it, you had our, well, I think what happened was you really had to earn your stripes, so to speak, to get into the third level. You really, it wasn't easy. And then they came along with the control thing, and let's say the, the whole system became a little more flexible. And uh, whereas in the past, the severe condition, basically, and even the third level, was that they denied the prisoners any rehabilitative services because they ascertained that if you want, it was, not, it was wasting a lot of resources. But that's about as far as it got. It didn't, it certainly was not to the level of the, the lockdown and things of that nature. Um, but the severity came in. Um, the, it's, it's, you've got to avoid arguments here of economics. It's really sad that the only reason as the society were saying, well, we won't put more people in prison because it costs too much. I mean, it costs the individual to be put in prison, I would think, and those who he's affiliated with. Um, we've got to look at the whole judicial system, and it's not a very good system. It's broken in some respects. Um, it's very dangerous to say that this is inherently dangerous to say that you have unfairness or inequities, inequitable aspects to a system of justice that is based on demographics or some other irrelevant factors. You're getting into the very fabric of your society when people don't think there's a basic fundamental fairness. And there is, I don't care, we have a philosophy group. We discuss a lot of ethics, but there is a basic fairness concept that is operative with people. I should know this. Now, regarding this, Mike, federal employees cannot kill people whenever I'm a federal employee. And we have very dedicated law enforcement people, and they do not kill people whenever they feel like it. And you are entitled to do process. No, and you're talking a lot of nonsense. Now the other thing is, one of the aspects of the judicial system, and I use it all the time, is the plea bargain, is we use the term settlement, or uh, you cut a deal, whatever. This There's even requirements that the two representatives, the two lawyers, in a punishment situation have to confer and discuss reasonable settlement. It's to the advantage of the accused in many, many cases. And why don't you just give them a hundred So don't tell me anything. If you're gonna talk silliness, be silly. Now, the other thing about it, society, you have to think where did we come from is also our, our fabric of human rights. All right, I'm going to get through this. Some of the things, we are making progress. I, I'm always reminded of the fact 
that in England, prior to the American Revolution, you could be executed for 263 crimes. So we're getting a little better now. The other thing is, I like to watch these crime shows on TV, not, not the cop ones, the other ones, where they, they have the people that I like the wife, they have one where the wives kill their husbands or something. <laughs> well, they, they never... <laughs> uh, also, in terms of criminal activity, uh, my young friend there, I think we've got to expand the law codes of the United States. And if you really want to identify criminal activity, it's the people who build nuclear reactors. Uh, dig fracking oil wells and a whole bunch of other things that destroy this this entire country. And I agree planet. with you, Charlie, Kill 100 percent. You know where do you think that toxic water came from? Because of some guy. <laughs> it's because to make the old money. technology's he not being to innovated. Make money. And the, wall, the guy who owns Walmart put him in jail. <laughs> oh, mess of all, yeah, moral cup. And then oh, find Jesus. Go, oh, they become. Christians I'll be there tomorrow with Springbrook Community jail. Church. Charlie. All the Christians, put them in there. And last of all, I just want to say, the honest thing, I really wasn't watching this thing, but you look about crime and punishment. I didn't really identify this, and it's finally not that popular, positive a thing. But the guy alluded to the fact that Christ was not punished by crucifixion simply because it was too difficult to construct a cross and put them up. And he said the Roman soldiers wouldn't have been doing this. And they may have done some other things, but he says no. And they went through it and they said they would never do this. They just wouldn't bother. They, they would punish people and they, they had other means like that. So there's so much for your Christian stuff. Anyhow, thank you very much for coming again for an update yeah. on what's going on. Okay. <laughs> Ron Bassford. Oh, so, I'm a thank you, Charlie. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, since he's going to have me, what, uh, crucified? Or, uh, I, I, I think that uh, the managers of cold restaurants should be imprisoned in cold restaurants in t-shirts. Hey, it's hot in here. But uh, only for the length of time that, that people have to be in those in cold restaurants. But at any rate, uh, when it comes to uh, punishment. Uh, what the, the, the point of punishment is uh, to set somebody right who is obviously uh, or apparently uh, to somebody uh, uh, who is in a position to judge uh, doing wrong. Uh, one can question uh, judgment, and one can question uh, the, uh, the, the uh, cure. Uh, frankly, uh, I, I don't think that we have uh, found the cure for uh, crime, uh, but I do think, uh, I, I, I rather agree with Charles uh, that uh, we we should uh, have a society where, where uh, what everybody needs is uh, available, and uh, that means uh, production. It means production, and I, I think that uh, uh, because the capitalist system rewarded uh, some people who aided uh, production uh, that it was became a viable system. However, uh, the uh, uh, capitalist system is not a democratic system. It is not a, an egalitarian system. It is not a humanitarian system. It is human, but it is not humanitarian. And uh, 
therefore it should pass away uh, and be uh, transformed into a more humanitarian and more productive system. Uh, since it's obviously not that productive uh, and has uh, a very uh, great economic and social uh, flaws. Okay, but how do you do that? That's a big question, and we should get into those questions uh, perhaps a little deeper than uh, uh, simply saying, well, down with the prisons. Well, uh, but maybe we certainly have to say something about the, uh, something better than prisons. Okay. Uh, where we see, uh, we got some uh, more. Now we have our, unless we have some second rounders. Yeah, do, oh uh, yeah, some people are never at loss. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but before we do that, uh, let's see how, what's your opinion? Uh, do you, do you want to stay for a second round of, uh, speakers? No. 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 Okay. In that case, so we won't have a second round of speakers. Uh, we will have our uh, lead speaker, uh, uh, Nancy. Uh, this is going to be very short and very sweet. I don't see how you rebut all the things that were said in the previous. Uh, hour or so. I just want to thank everybody for coming and I want to thank the College of Complexes for having me and uh, if you have letters that were passed around to sign for Oscar Lopez Rivera and you'd like to sign them and give them to me, I would be glad to take them and I thank you for the evening. Thank you all. I even thank Charles book. Even if he wants to imprison me, um, okay, Nancy, real <laughs> as quick, as a Christian, where do people get a hold of you? Where do you buy, they buy your book? And uh, give us a web address of where they can reach you for our YouTube what? audience. Uh, no, no, you can't say it. One, one quick announcement here: that no one should be deluded. The restaurant is per purposely made cold so that we'll end the evening sooner, so that we'll leave. That's by design. Uh, 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 all right, uh, let, let no, Nancy, let I Nancy. I want to sell us hot soup. Okay. Okay. Wow. All right, Brown, give her, give her the mic so she can let us know where to get her book and uh, her web address and a few other things. Where can we get your book? You can uh, go online to, excuse me, freedomarchives, all one word, dot org, freedomarchives.org. That's the publisher of my book. And um, you can just click on Out of Control, and it'll take you to a place where you can buy the book. I mean, you can also buy it on Amazon, but... Or tonight. I, I have or books here, right tonight. here. Okay. But, Do you have a website or... Some way that the other people from the web can look up your your organization. Well, if you go to freedomarchives.org, you can see an online version of my book and lots of media, audio, video clips, all kinds of stuff. And um, I think that's the best way to go. Okay. Let's thank our speaker one more time, and we'll call it a wrap. Thank you. Hi. Right, very nice.